Hey, Slider Crusaders, America's the greatest country in the world. Merry Christmas. Thanks for being here. What a uh, bizarre time this is. Christmas in America. It's bizarre because you are inundated with distraction, to put it nicely. And my point of this special is to help encourage you to focus. There's a great scene in the first letter of the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. Have you ever read it? You have to, if you haven't. So just to remind you, this is a series of letters written from the perspective of a demon, Screw Tape, to his nephew, Wormwood, right? So Screw Tape is giving advice to his nephew on how to keep his nephew's patient, a man, from becoming a Christian. Right? So it's all written from a demon's perspective. It's absolutely brilliant. But in the first chapter, Wormwood is telling the story of one of his patients that he used to have, who's an atheist, right? Remember the demons trying to keep him an atheist. And his patient one day was sitting in a museum and he was starting to think about God. And Wormwood said, before I knew where I was, I saw my 20 years of work beginning to totter. So he knew that he had to stop this guy from thinking about God anymore, but he couldn't stop him by uh, bringing up logic or anything, or any sort of logical argument to disprove God. So instead, this is what Wormwood said, I struck instantly at the part of the man which I, the demon, had best under my control and suggested that it was just about time he had some lunch. <laughs> so, so the enemy, the Holy Spirit, told the man that no, this is the time to think about God. Thinking about God is more important than lunch. And the demon, told, the demon told the man, yes, yes, this is a very important, such important thing that we should probably come back after lunch and get at it with a fresh mind. And then the man got up, stopped thinking about God, left the museum to go get some lunch. On his way out, he saw uh, an advertisement on the side of a bus, and there was the local paper boy uh, selling newspapers. So he saw the local newspaper headlines, and the demon's job was done. The man was properly distracted first by food, then by materialism, the ad on the side of the bus, and then by current events in the newspaper. And then the man became too busy, much too busy, to worry and think anymore about silly things like God. It's a brilliant passage. It's in the very first chapter of the book. I didn't do it nearly good enough justice there. But if you look around at Christmas in America and how it's fed to you, you could see how easily distracted we are. So I want to share my conclusion right now of this whole hour of putting the Christ back in Christmas. You don't have to eat what the world feeds you. That's true always, but maybe it's especially important now and for Christmas. You don't have to eat what the world feeds you. Curate your inputs for you and your family for Christmas. You don't even have to keep the same traditions that you've always had. Maybe you had these traditions from when you were a kid. You don't have to do them. You don't have to. Make your own. Make better ones. I just want to give you permission to do that. I want to give you permission to make Christmas whatever you want it to be, whatever you think it should be. But it's hard to even know what to do or where we're even off track because we're just so inundated and, and, and people are so confused. They don't even realize it, right? So let's give you some examples. Jesus is known, one of his names, the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. But this time is all about rushing around furiously in traffic and malls and airports and rising suicide rates. It's not very peaceful. 2,000 years ago, there's one star that lit the sky. Today, there's millions of LED lights on houses everywhere, and there's giant neon signs pointing you to where you should buy things that you can't afford and can't fit. The first Christmas was a poor one in a manger. Just, just contemplate the poverty of that stable. And today, Christmas is all about materialistic wealth. Right? Black Friday sales. How high can we pile the presents under the tree? Wise men, the Magi, which deserves its own proper sermon. We couldn't fit it in today, though. Who were these, these, these wise men? But they, they came to, to worship Jesus. And today, people have parties, ugly sweater parties, or whatever, right? I want to quote John MacArthur on this one. He said, The babe of Bethlehem was born a savior to give men all that they need. He's been replaced by a huckster named Santa Claus, whose entire verbal contribution to the world is ho, ho, ho. 
Santa gives you what you want because you deserve it, right? You behaved properly. So Santa gives you what you want because you deserve it. Jesus gave you what you didn't even know you needed, and he gave it to you even though you don't deserve it. Quite the opposite. You think of the quietness of Bethlehem that night with the, the noise of, of the, the shopping mall. We went from angels to flying reindeer. <laughs> see, see what I'm talking about? So don't be distracted. That's my first point. Try your best not to be distracted and to focus. But the question is, well, what is Christmas all about? I heard someone say just the other day, and, and you hear it all the time, you've heard it for years, and I used to say it, and I'm, I'm sure you've said it before, but we hear that Christmas is about family. No. <laughs> like, eh, no, it's not. It's not about family. And I think people who say that, you, they usually think they're being uh, like, uh, like more righteous or something. Like they're being very kind. Because right? you have the people over there who think Christmas is all about the gifts and the materialist things. But then I, the wiser, superior one, I know that Christmas is really all about family. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Some families are really bad and sad and broken. Some are evil, full of alcoholics and abusers. Some family members are dead or live really far away, and Christmas is a time of terrible loneliness. Suicides go up this time of year a lot. Why? Because Christmas is not about family. Maybe one reason why suicides are up around this time of year is because people, uh, there's, there's this push to make Christmas about family, and it's not. It's not. Family's good. And that family scene of everyone all cuddled up around the fire on that Christmas night with candles and blankets, reading you know, the night before Christmas together around the fire, or whatever, like, that's great. That's not what Christmas is all about. Now I'm, I'm, I'm with my family this Christmas and I can't wait. We're going to make cinnamon buns and we're going to have this whole, like we got like all these like traditions that we, around the family. It's great. I can't wait for it. That's not what Christmas is all about. It may be a nice thing that happens during Christmas for you and I hope you do. I hope you do have it. But it is not what Christmas is all about. It's about Jesus Christ. Quick time out before I go on. I consider myself a bit of a cultural anthropologist. Right? That's my job. It's my job to, to help uh, illuminate the culture of today that we're swimming in, and most people don't even realize what it is around them that's happening, right? We're so immersed in it that people can't see it. So that's my first job is like, hey, everyone, here's what the culture is today, and, and it's bad. Uh, and then also to help explain the biblical worldview, the worldview that most people in America used to have and took for granted, but we don't have it anymore. We've strayed so far past it, we, we've lost sight of what it even was, right? So it's Hey, everyone, here's the, the culture, the postmodern atheist culture we're living in today. Here was the biblical worldview that we used to have. So let's decide how we want to proceed here. That's my job. And I think I'm a good person for this because I was an atheist or agnostic. I guess I didn't really care for a long time before I became a Christian. And I vividly remember what it was like to not be a Christian and the things I said and the questions I had and the things I didn't want to confront and how I saw the world versus how I see it today. I vividly remember that. So I can go between both of these world. I grew up a Christer. A Christer. We went to church on Christmas and Easter. That's it. And I, rem I remember our pastor was super boring. We'd go to the midnight sermon, midnight mass. Uh, it was a Presbyterian church. We'd go to midnight mass on Christmas Eve night. I don't know why. Right? We're just all like super tired. But uh, the pastor was like the pastor in the Simpsons. <laughs> so super boring. Not Ned Flanders, but the other guy, right? And we would just mock him and talk about how boring he was. And I knew, I had no idea what he was talking about. All I, I, every year I just remember like farm animals being talked about and like, that's all. I had no idea what anything was about. I never knew the gospel. No one ever told me the gospel, <laughs> right? How can, like, how can I grow up? I never knew what the gospel was. Like everyone should know it. So I want to give it to you in 60 seconds. I'll give you the 60 second gospel. And then I want to end with a, a story from Paul Harvey and we'll get to our two wonderful guests, uh, including a, a pastor who I heard the other day and he gave one of the best sermons I've ever heard in my entire life. So I'm excited to talk to him more. So here's the, the, here's the story, right? This is the gospel, the good news. Gospel means good news. So God created the world and everything in it. Then he created Adam and Eve to live in perfect harmony with each other and with him. Sin entered the world. We, therefore, are born sinners. Our sin that we commit every single day constantly creates a division between us and God. That division, our sin, causes us to go to hell. Why? Because God is a just God. But he's also a loving God. So he sent his only son to earth to live as a human, to show us the way, 
and to die the death that you and I deserve. Three days later, resurrected from the dead, now he sits at the right hand of God. He paid your debt of sin for you. He paid your debt. He paid the consequences of your sin for you. And all you have to do is repent and make him Lord of your life, and now you too can go to heaven. That's the story. Do what you want with it. You disagree with it, <laughs> you can roll your eyes at it, you be like, that's a stupid story, whatever. I'm just telling you what it is. The gospel literally means good news. I think our biggest cultural mistake in, in our post-Christian world, we talk about this all the time, is that people think we're basically good. And if you think that, then you think that you don't need saving, and if you don't need saving, you don't need to save your. 72% of Christians believe that man is basically good. That's heretical and, and horrific. But if everyone understood what a wretch you are, I am, and how you desperately need a savior to save you, then the fact that God sent his son to take the punishment that you deserve proves how much God loves you. He sent his son to pay the consequences of your sin so that you don't go to hell, but instead can go to heaven. That's incredible. And there's the gospel. So Christians, when we celebrate uh, Jesus coming uh, incarnate, that means in the flesh, literally means in the flesh, like in, in, and then carno, incarnate, carno, like carnal or carnivore, like in the flesh. Uh, that's what Christmas is, right? Arguably, we can go back and forth. The Easter is maybe the most important. That's the whole resurrection part, but God, you know, Jesus came to earth, right? So here's Philippians uh, 2, 6, right? This is an important uh, scripture right here. Who, so this describes Jesus. Who? Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, right? He was God. But he made himself nothing, a human, by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, again, for your sins. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So there's a ton of sermons that could, be, that could be preached on just what I read right there. But the fact is that he made himself nothing. He humbled himself, obedient even to death on the cross for you. Now, why? Why? Or I should say, why did he have to do it that way? That was one of the biggest questions that I always had growing up with this story. Why did God do it this way? Why did Jesus have to become human? He didn't have to, right? If you, if you think about it this way, God could have done it in any way he wanted, right? Why this way? Why make Jesus incarnate on earth? What's the point of that? What's the benefit of that? There has to be a reason for it. Why did he do it that way? Paul Harvey has a nice little story that answers this question. So it's a story about a good man. <clears throat> right? Good, decent, generous man. He just didn't believe all the, the Bible, like the miracles, the incarnation, all the silly stuff, right? He didn't, so it's Christmas Eve, and, and he did not go to church with his family. So his wife and kids, they went off to church. He stayed back at home because he just didn't want to deal with all that silliness, right? So he stayed home, and he's sitting at home. I'm imagining, you can imagine any way, you can imagine your house. I'm imagining like he's in like a cabin for some reason. I don't know why. But he's in a cabin. There's a fireplace going the whole thing. Right? And there's a big storm outside. Big, huge blizzard just whipping outside his house. And he hears this doom on the window. He's like, what was that? And then he hears another one. Doof, doof, doof. And he just keeps hearing these pounds on the window. So he goes and he notices these birds are flying into his window. Right? The storm is crazy out there and these birds are all mixed up. They don't know what they're doing. So they're crashing into his window. And he's a good, decent man, right? So he doesn't want these birds to get hurt. So he goes outside and he sees these birds and they're all huddled in the snow. They're lost, they're clueless, they're, right? Freezing, right? He doesn't know what to do. Or the birds don't know what to do. So he decides to help these birds. And he thinks, well, this is no problem. I'll just go and I'll open up this barn door. He's got this barn on his property. Right there you go, this is the barn. This is the barn. He's got this barn door, he's gonna open it up and I'll turn the light on for him. And then the birds will go in there and they stay someplace safe and warm during the storm. So the man bundles up and he walks out to the bar and he opens up the door, turns the light on, and the birds don't go anywhere. So he tells the birds to go. He's like, come on, let's go. He starts waving his arms. The birds don't move. 
So he tries to shoo him, right? So he like sneaks behind him. And he's like, shoot him. Like, go, go, come on, let's go. And the birds don't move. They just stay there. They're scared. So the man's like, ah, I got it, no problem. He goes inside to get some bread, right? Get some breadcrumbs. He starts to make a trail from the birds to the, the barn, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna lure them into the barn. They may not even know what they're doing, but I'm gonna do it for their own good. And the birds don't move because they're scared of him. They fear him. And the man got so frustrated and he finally thought, this is so annoying. If only I could be a bird. If only I could just be a bird and I could speak their language. And I could mingle with them. I could be with them. I could go with the birds and I could tell them, don't be afraid. I could show them the way to safety. I could show them the way to the warm barn so they can make it through the storm. I could show them the light. If only I could be one of them so that they could hear and understand. That's what Jesus did. He became one of us so that we could follow him and go to heaven. Oh, but Slater, uh, you know, Jesus, blah, blah, blah. I like Santa. Santa's fun and all these other things. Santa and, and lights and blah, blah. So that stuff brings me joy. Mm. Yeah, I promise you, if you this Christmas solely, solely reflect on the true story of Christmas, I promise you, well, try me. I would suggest I would predict that if you solely focus on Jesus this Christmas, that your Christmas will be the most joy-filled Christmas you've ever had, regardless of anything else that's going on in your life. We have two wonderful guests next, and we'll wrap up with a little, little thing I got about Santa Claus. We'll do that next. Merry Christmas. Mike Slater, spread the word. Hey, Slater Crusaders, welcome back to our special, Putting the Christ Back in Christmas. A couple weeks ago, I was visiting a friend's church, and they had a, a guest speaker, and it was one of the uh, best sermons I've ever heard in my life. It was about Mark 4, the man in the tombs, and here's just a quick snippet of that. Can you relate to the man of the tombs? Can you relate to him? Or, or is he some different species than you in your mind? This man has lived such a self-destructive life. And other people have been, been beaten up, no doubt, in the, in the effort to subdue him. They, they can't even do it. And you know they took a beating when they tried then. Here he is living in a graveyard, destroying himself and other people, away from his home, away from his family, and he's dying. And so are all of us until Jesus gives us new life. My wife and I love that part so much because every time we've ever heard a sermon on Mark 4, it's always about you should be like Jesus and help the man of the tomb. Help, help those lowly people down there. And it's like, no, no, you are the man of the tombs. It's uh, Dr. Eric Taunus. He's a professor and chair of theology at Biola University in uh, L.A. and the pastor at Grace Evangelical Free Church in La Mirada, which is also a part of L.A. Doctor, how are you, sir? I'm doing well, Mike. How are you today? Wonderful to talk to you. I'm grateful you're here. Um, I guess we can, we can tie in Mark 4 uh, to the Christmas story as well, but um, let's go back to that, that first day. <laughs> can you help us visualize and understand uh, the importance of the birth of Jesus and, and what was going on around that time? I think the most impressive thing about the birth of Jesus, who is God in flesh, is how unimpressive it was superficially in a worldly sense if I were God and let's all thank God I'm not and I were going to come to my creation I would do it with a lot of fanfare I would do it in a really impressive way and God did it in a way that one old great hymn says mild he lays his glory by born that man no more may die and so he's born to a poor couple who are from a, a backwater nothing village named Nazareth that has a bad reputation. They came, can't even afford the normal sacrifice when they come to offer sacrifice for the new baby. And there's nowhere for them to stay. And 
it, it's the, the lowest conditions you could imagine. And God is so clearly making a point that it's not about superficial impressiveness, but who he is and the kind of character he's going to have as the God man. We desperately needed him to come to us in our mess. And that's exactly what he did, not just spiritually, but literally. How different from how we are supposed to celebrate Christmas today with more, more, more and materialism and bright lights and all that. It's just, it's the exact opposite of what it was. Yeah, it's it's gotten way off course in so many ways as society's gotten a hold of it and commercialized it and made it all about Black Friday and and not about God coming to us and our desperate need for him to do that. What's the significance of the manger? Uh, is, it, is it anything beyond just the, the poverty of it or is there something more significant of that? And the fact that there was no room, room at the inn. Yeah, I, I think when the Bible tells us that God came to his own creation in sending his son, that he came to his own and his own did not receive him is what's going on there, is, is that there's a literal physical representation of the kind of spiritual rejection we have for God just in our fallen natures, but also then in our response to him. When he comes to us in amazing grace, we're inclined to say, you know, I got this. I got this figured out. I, I don't need some dramatic help like this. I just need a little more time, a little more education, a little better parenting. And, and we humans will get all this figured out. But we need to be rescued by a God who came to us, not when we were even looking for rescue, but when we hated him. Hmm. What about the, uh, the, the Magi? What's significant about that part of the story? Yeah, so one of the inaccuracies of the, tip, the typical manger scene, it, scene is that the, the wise men or the magi are there at his birth. It's, it's more likely they were there when he was around two because Herod at that time gives the command to kill all the Jewish babies two and under. So he's suspecting that this star appeared and this baby was born about two years before that. But the magi show up as an example of of the wisest human beings coming to Christ who is our wisdom and they bow before him. And so it's, it's a submission of mere human wisdom to divine wisdom in this superficially unimpressive baby. Mm, I love that. And I was going to ask you about Herod too. Uh, why did Herod want to, why, why did he order to kill all newborn Jewish babies? And what, what's important about that? Yeah. Every step along the way, Jesus was opposed in a few weeks, actually on Super Bowl Sunday, I'm going to be preaching on John 15. That Jesus says, the world hated me, the world's going to hate you. Just know that's part of the deal. And, and so he came and was opposed every step of the way. By satanic power, we see most clearly on his at his temptation, on the Mount of Temptation, as he begins his public ministry. But every step of the way, from, from his birth on, he is opposed by not only the spiritual forces of darkness, but human opposition and governmental opposition. And, and so the one who made us all is opposed by us. And so he was, he was facing opposition from the beginning, including Herod, who, who was jealous. He, he didn't want his power to be usurped by this Messiah figure that he was hearing about. Let me ask this question, Professor. Uh, so in the last segment, I talked about how I was a Christer growing up. I went to church Christmas and Easter twice a year. Twice a year, I've only been a Christian for maybe like eight years or so. So, but I remember what I was like when I was an atheist. And whenever I talk with someone as brilliant as you about the Bible, I always go back to like my atheist way of thinking and the questions that uh, a cynical atheist would have had uh, as, you're, as you're talking, right? As opposed to like a faithful believer who's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. What and this is a bit of an apologetics question, but what, what, what is sufficient proof for you or someone that this all happened, right? Like it was said, the Magi, the Star, the, all of this, as opposed to just a silly made-up story, Professor, Chair of Theology at Biola University. It's just a silly story you guys made up, and you're worshiping this whole silly goofiness. What's your proof? 
Yeah, I think an important question to begin with before we get to the specifics of the story is, do you think there's a God? And if so, do you think he intervenes in human history or he's just sort of running things from a distance? Well, the, the Christian worldview is that there is a creator God. And since the first nanosecond of creation, he's been intimately, personally and meaningfully involved in his creation, including in ways that we consider miraculous or supernatural that don't go according to the normative ways of things happening, whether that's Jesus walking on water, or turning water into wine, or God sending a revealing star to the shepherds, or the virgin birth for that matter, or that God can take on a human nature. Any of these miracles need to fit within a worldview that allows for miracles. Is there even the ability of the miraculous? And so that's an important question to ask. But then I, I, if someone says, no, I don't believe in God, I, therefore I don't believe in miracles, I don't even believe in a spiritual realm, I can say, well, great, we're both clear about our worldviews that we're coming to this with. I do believe in a God. I do believe he intervenes in history. I do believe he rescues us from our sinful condition. And I think he does it miraculously very often. So, so we have different worldviews. Now, how do we get to those is going to be my question now. How did you arrive at your atheistic, naturalistic worldview? And it's going to come from some authority that you're submitting to. It may be your gut. It may be some really influential English teacher you had junior year of high school. You may be getting your worldview from a Freudian view of things, a Marxist view of things, an Oprah view of things. It's coming from somewhere. It's probably a, a mishmash of those things. Well, I get mine from the Bible. That's my authority. And so now we can put our authorities on the table, if we can understand what they are, and compare how well they explain reality, how well they explain the human condition and, and human longings. And I've never come across anything that does it as well as the Bible. Mm, absolutely brilliant. All right, last question for you, Professor. Um, in the sermon that I heard, and you can listen to it on the Fields Church in Carlsbad, they have the sermon list, and you can see the professor's uh, sermon there. You can watch it. Um, you talked about being homesick. And I think this is such an important idea because I'm so worldly and so tied to the world and checking my bank account and stock portfolio, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what does it mean to be homesick? And what is that posture as you go through life and go through Christmas? The, the Christian life has this paradoxical tension between joy and heartache. The Bible says, be sorrowful and always rejoicing. It has a, a broken heartedness in the midst of deep hope and, 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 a, and a joy. And so that's because the world is both created by God and being redeemed by God. And at the same time, it's tragically broken and twisted with, with lots of pain and suffering along the way. And so a Christian who's paying attention to the news for 10 seconds is going to be broken hearted the effects of the tornado, if nothing else right now, should make you weep. And so a, a Christian who's paying attention doesn't have some simplistic, superficial joy, but a depth of joy that includes a brokenheartedness, which means we realize that this world is not what it was created to be in its sinful, fallen condition. And so we long for and look for and pray for the return of Christ who will one day make everything right and wipe away every tear, no more cancer, no more devastating natural disasters, but peace on earth, which is what he'll bring as the Prince of Peace. And so we have a homesickness for what's to come. We don't settle down here as if this is all there is. We're storing up treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't destroy and thieves don't break in and steal. We're living for what really lasts and what really matters. And so there's a homesickness in that. We're not home yet. We're sojourners and aliens in a foreign land, the Bible says. And so we long for that day and we are looking to that home that awaits. I hope my kids can uh, go to Biola University, sir, and you can be their professor. Uh, I want everyone to send their kids to Biola and take Derek, or Dr. Eric Taunus's class. He's a professor, chair of theology and also Grace Evangelical Free Church in La Mirada. Merry Christmas, sir. Thank you for your time. Brother, thank you. Very good. Uh, David Engelhart, coming up next. Pastor at uh, New York City, King's Church in New York City. Mike Slater, spread the word.
Hey, Slater Crusaders, welcome back to our special Putting the Christ in Christmas from one amazing pastor to another. He has a new book out. It's uh, Pastor David Engelhardt, King's Church, New York City. And uh, the name of the book is Good Kills. God, Good, and the Sword. I haven't read the whole thing, but I've read one chapter of it, and I came across this line here. Christians behave as spoiled children when pastors continually stuff them with the grace message and avoid talking about the damnable potency of sin and the consequent requirements of justice. To tell an individual you are not owed anything because a gift is being given creates a vastly different response than telling an individual they have rights to a gift. No one has a right to a gift. No one is owed a Christmas present. No one is owed the cross. It is because of the love of the parent that they give their child a gift, and it is the love of God that sends his son to be killed. Pastor, good to talk to you, sir. Congratulations on the book coming out. Again, uh, good kills. Everyone go buy it. Thanks, um, I love... Uh, I love debunking pithy statements that we say in our culture that everyone knows and they're just not true. Like, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It's one of my favorites. That's just, like, ridiculously not true. Yeah. But everyone thinks it's true because it, like, rolls off the tongue. Right. right. Uh, and this is another one. Life is a gift. Yeah. Debunk that, please. Yeah, I mean, first of all, it's it's debunkable in part because it's Eastern. It's Eastern theology, right? Eastern theology um, say, has this idea that you can live this life and you can do whatever you want with it. Be generally good to other people is, you know, inherent in that. But you really don't have to do whatever you want with it. You can kind of lay on the beach and, and live your life. But... Um, in the biblical order, if you read through the Bible, Genesis to Matthew chapter 1, there's not a single place in the Bible that calls life a gift. None of the Proverbs, none of the wisdom writings, uh, Moses, Abraham, nobody, nobody conceives of life as a gift, in part because of the incredible value of life. And that's built up in the book. The animate force is something that God allows us to have. He doesn't just say, hey, you can have this, do whatever you want with it. My dad got me a guitar when I was in the fourth grade. And like a year later, I stepped through the back of it. You know, it, was, it wasn't, he didn't really care what I did with it. When I was 17 or 16, I got another guitar and I learned how to play it and I spent time with it, it was really fun. He didn't care really much either way because with a gift, there wasn't a set of obligations to. But if there's an investment into you, if there's fiduciary duties that's attached, then you have to take, and that's why Jesus talks about the parable of the minus, right? The parable of the talents. This thing that's granted to you, you have to take and you have to multiply. And you can't just say, I'm going to put it in the dirt. I'm going to put it in my savings account. You know, in the parable of the talents, Jesus doesn't say to the guy that put his talents in the dirt, hey, cool, like, thanks for not wasting, thanks for not wasting it. It yeah. says, send that wicked servant out to be tortured and killed, essentially, right? Because life is something that you can't just hold on to. It's been granted to you by God. God for you to multiply. And this is why, as, as believers, Mike, we tend to be conservatives politically because our main values are life, family, children, all of these things that are so central to conservatism is because they flow forth from a proper theological understanding of the world around us. That's why we'll never let go of something like abortion. That's why we can't ever get rid of that and say, oh, the baby's just a gift. Actually, the Bible doesn't say the baby's a gift. It says that children are a heritage from the Lord. That means they're gods, and he grants them to you for a time. They don't belong to you. You can't do whatever you want with those lives. You have a certain fiduciary duty, and one day you will answer to God for your life. Mm. Okay. Uh, Pastor, this sounds very, I agree, this all sounds very works-based, right? You're, you're outlining a works-based religion when grace is a gift. What do you say to that? Well, I mean, there there is a bifurcation to understand that that the cross is a gift, that the New Testament says that Jesus Christ and salvation is a gift. But once you come into the kingdom, the works aren't thrown away. And that's a really shallow understanding in Protestantism and really mainline evangelicalism. Mm -hmm. Those guys just, just forgot to read their Bibles because James clearly says that faith without works is dead. If you look at all of the, of the churches of Revelation, Mike, when Jesus judges those churches in, Re in Revelation chapter 2, and three. He never says to them, I know your heart, or I see your faith, and I know your great intention. He says to each church, I see your deeds. And then he tells them they're either on the brink of losing their place in heaven or that they're doing a good job. Two out of five of the churches are doing good, five are doing poorly. That is based wholly upon their deeds. And we've forgotten that major part of 
faith is the thing that unlocks the door. But once we step into the new kingdom, deeds are central because they are a representation of faith. Uh, so good. Okay, let's bring it to Christmas here. Uh, what are we to do with Jesus coming incarnate to the world? Yeah. How, how does this all relate? Yeah. Well, this is our, this is this is really huge because uh, the gift must be accepted. Right. So life has this baseline set of obligations, fiduciary duties, obedience, don't kill other people, all of these kind of stuff. Jesus, as a gift, comes and God says, please accept it. Jesus said, in order to accept me, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood, which is a really crazy way to accept a gift. But the idea is that we take his, you just use the word incarnate, we take his body and blood and we make it a part of our life. And this is the this is the parallel, the prophetic picture of Mary carrying Jesus. The divinity of God fuses with the mortality of man and creates in us new life, this life in Christ Jesus that is a gift. But we must embody it. We must let Jesus walk through us and live through us. And when we do that, and we embody the new gift, then we live in this new life in Christ, this fr this freedom, this joy, this peace, all of these second order things come after we begin to do what the incarnation is all about. Mary, you know, could, holding Jesus in her womb, somehow Mary's mortal body is being fused with the divinity of God himself, and it's creating God life inside of her. And that's what's supposed to happen to all of us Christians, it's a prophetic picture that God comes inside of us. Romans chapter 5 says that the Spirit of Christ lives inside of us in a, this kind of similar way that Jesus is growing inside of us and the gift of his grace and goodness is giving me life and changing me so that I can be more like God intended to me. And that is a gift. That growth, that change is not based upon my good works. It's not merited upon my past decision, but it's because I'm allowing the Spirit of God to, to change me and, and, and make me. And, and the carnation and the, this divinity thing are meeting together in this mysterious fusing, and that's what happens on Christmas. Good night. Out of all the Christmas stories we've all ever heard, I've never heard such a focus on the fusion of like the, like the blood flesh fusion of Jesus and Mary together. That's brilliant. And of course, of course, mm. pastor, we got to run. Uh, give me like a 20 second final Christmas message that you want us all to leave with. Um, stop saying happy holidays for the love of God. And to you, <laughs> and to you and yours, yeah. uh, God, a good, good kills. God, good, and the sword. It just came out now. Can't wait to read it. David Engelhardt, King's Church, New York City. Merry Christmas, sir. Thanks, Mike. We'll talk again. Uh, coming up next, uh, <laughs> let's talk about Santa Claus <laughs> and why there's no Santa in the Slater home. It's next. Put the Christ back at Christmas. Mike Slater, spread the word. Hey, Slater Crusaders, welcome back. What an awesome special. All right, I want to give my hot take on uh, Santa. What is a Christian to do with Santa Claus? First, I just want to say, do whatever you want. <laughs> right, this is merely a suggestion, and maybe this is the first time you've ever heard of this suggestion, so you can take it, you can reject it, you do whatever you want. There's no need to feel attacked or judged. I'm not attacking. Don't get defensive. Everyone, we need to lay our weapons down on this conversation, right? Also, if your kids are nearby, maybe it's now not a great time. You can turn it down. We can close caption this segment if you prefer, right? I'll just tell you, there's no Santa Claus in the Slater home. Now, people say, oh, so you're such a stick in the mud, such a Scrooge. He's just say he's harmless fun. He's imaginative. He's creative. Represents the joy in the hearts of everyone. In my heart, Santa will always exist. Okay. Uh, here's, here's why. I believe that telling your kid that Santa exists uh, is, first of all, lying to them. And I think we confuse our children about what is true and what is pretend if we pretend what is not true is true. Just don't lie to your kids. That's the first thing. But also, here's the bigger thing. I think telling your kids over and over for years that Santa is true, I think it's training them to deconstruct their faith and reject God later in life. Because kids will think, and this was true for me, 
not consciously, but it's like more subconscious because they're just kids. But they'll think that Santa Claus, the Tooth Fairy, the Easter Bunny, and God are all these things that you believe in when you're a kid, but you grow out of as you become an adult. Right? These things are all grouped together as silly things that you believe in when you're young, but they're just superstitions that eventually you become you know, mature and you learn that that's just, that's just, that's just uh, things that adults make up to manipulate a kid's behavior. So I'll bring this up and people are like, oh, okay, maybe that's something, but uh, oh, you know, it's horrible that we're going to destroy Santa Claus. No, you're not. Here's the compromise. And I don't find this offensive at all. People get all worked up about it. Santa Claus is made up. He's not real. But either is Batman, and he's awesome, and Superman's not real, and Cinderella's not real. My daughter loves Cinderella, and we teach my daughter, she's three and a half, that Cinderella is kind and courageous. And she can learn from the story of Cinderella. The Grinch isn't real. Here's the perfect example. My kids, they love the Grinch. They don't think the Grinch is real. And I don't see any parents like going through great lengths to like convince their kids that the Grinch is real. Like we don't leave food out for the Grinch or like a bone out for the dog or something. Like we just, we're like, oh, here's a fun story and here's a great lesson. And uh, the, the Whoville and the whatever. Like we're not like, oh, Whoville is a place up in the North Pole. Like we don't do that. So I don't know why we even do it with Santa. And some people are like, oh, I teach about St. Nicholas. Okay, great. St. Nicholas is a real person or whatever, right? So here's the legend of St. Nicholas. That's great. And we can live those values. Awesome. Right? Like, I don't understand why we, why we have to go the extra lengths with Santa and be like, no, kid, he's real. <laughs> like, kids can still have the magic of Santa without you telling him he's real. And right? No. And I just, I don't even understand why we would make up a counterfeit version of God. Because that's all Santa is. He's a counterfeit fake version of God. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. No, God is way better than Santa. Way, way better. God is actually all-knowing. God is actually everywhere. And you shouldn't be good for goodness' sake. You should do it. You should be good for his sake. To glorify God, not yourself. Now, there's people who say there's room for both. Right, Santa and Jesus. Slater, why are you such a Scrooge? You can have fun with Santa and know the real reason for the season. Eh, the story of Jesus is way better than the story of Santa Claus. Like, way, way, like, way, way better. I don't even know why we want to come up with another story around this time of year. Right? Like, this one's awesome. This story of Jesus is amazing. Like, why have this amazing main feast and then we like bring this thing and like it's like, oh, well, this is like, this is it's not as good of a thing. I don't, why, why are we doing that? It's the C.S. Lewis line. I love this line. He said, we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Santa is... Yeah, bright and fat and red and colorful, whatever. But why divert attention from the incarnation of God of the universe into the world to save us for all of eternity so we can go to heaven, right? Compared to Jesus, Santa is pitiful. He offers nothing lasting. You're like, oh, Santa's full of joy. Or whatever. Yeah, Jesus is way better. Also, Santa, is a, he's a work-based religion. It better be good. <laughs> but then even if you're bad, your kids still get gifts. And they know it, so Santa's not even truthful. He lies. God is truthful. Santa shows up once a year. God's with you always. Santa doesn't hold a candle to the flame of Jesus. Santa won't solve any of your problems. God transforms your heart and your life. If Jesus is the greatest treasure in the world, why would you think to dilute it? Why even add Santa to the mix? You with me? So first of all, it's a lie. Second, it trains your kids to think of all these things as make-believe fairy tales. Uh, and that's not good. And then third, uh, there's no margin. You know, we just don't have the margin in today's culture anymore. Maybe in the past, when our culture was all about God and Jesus all year, then we could have some fun with Santa around this time of year, right? But when we have a culture that says God and Jesus are, well, we have a culture that where God and Jesus are never mentioned. And if they are, they're openly mocked and ridiculed. No, like we don't have time for this. The margins are too small. We need to err on the side of God and Jesus only. So I just want to issue a suggestion, a challenge perhaps, that every present you open, every decoration you have, 
all of your singing, your giving, every food, all the food you make, I hope, just, I hope that all of it can point to Jesus. And if, well, this, this is a bold sentence. I think I, I, think I stole this from um, Tim Keller. I think this is from Tim Keller. He says, if you think being Jesus-focused is a killjoy for your Christmas, but, but raise yourself in this sentence. This is it's quite a sentence. If you think being Jesus-focused is a killjoy for your Christmas, then you don't know Jesus. Don't get mad at me for that sentence. Think about it for a while. Just think about it. And just go all in. Just this Christmas, try it. Right? Yeah, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, it's a fun song, whatever. But so is joy to the world. And come let us adore him in holy night. Oh, come all ye faithful. Hark the herald angels sing. Holy night's my favorite Christmas song. Maybe the greatest song ever. <laughs> just try it. Just like, like no dumb Christmas songs this year. <laughs> right? No, I, just see what happens. Right? Read It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. Just read it. And then compare those lyrics to Rudolph or Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer. <laughs> right? <laughs> Your Christmas is going to be full of so much more joy than you could ever imagine. And you'll see Santa as a mere mud pie compared to Jesus. Let's be different from the world. Hope you have a wonderful Christmas. Thanks, Slater. Spread the word.